So just to kind of uh, uh, introduce you to, uh, to the learning today, um, Today, the topic, as I as I wrote for you guys in the when in the email that I sent you yesterday, um, I we're starting the process of this journey of the bridge with the first section, uh, which I called the recognition of the space that exists between two people, and that quote from Buber, right, that the relationship lives in the space that exists between two people is like a kind of a fascinating concept that you don't think about, or I, I before I started preparing for this, I, I kind of took it for granted. I, you know, like, you know, it's me, and then there's the other person, but this quote alerts me to the reality of this intangible, intangible energy, intangible space that exists that is, is where, according to Buber, in his insight, where the relationship lives. And I will spend this session and next session in exploring what does it mean? What is it inside that, uh, that space? And in order to begin to do that, I right away what came to me as I was preparing, uh, kind of like thinking about this concept of the space in between, uh, something very, direct came, which is the figures that are at the Kodesh Kodeshim, in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, um, in the desert. The tabernacle, for those of you who might not be familiar with that, was this structure that was uh, constructed by Bezalel, you know, the, uh, you know, the artist by, by excellence in our tradition uh, during their 40 years in the desert in this you know in the shortly after they had left uh, Egypt in their 40 years journey and God commanded the Moses and the Jewish people after the you know the disaster of the golden calf and the sense of like despair of having broken the covenant the direct relationship with God uh, through you know idol worship with a with a with a, a golden calf, God said to Moses, "Build me, be, build me a tabernacle, so that there will be a structure that contains the infinite, right? That can contain my presence amongst the Jewish people." So the tabernacle became this kind of like portable you know, experience of closeness, experience of intimacy, experience of contact with God that existed throughout the 40 years in the desert, that the Jews assembled and disassembled as they made their stops. You know, the, what, I don't remember how many stops there were, you know, 30 something, 20 something stops throughout those 40 years, assembled and disassembled and carried that structure and that presence in their midst, the, the tabernacle was in the center and the Jewish people um, walked in the desert in a formation surrounding the tabernacle. And that's how they traveled in the desert throughout the 40 years. The tabernacle is, has a, a structure of like, you know, the inner and then an outer and an outer, just different layers of the tabernacle. And in the inner, most inner, 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 in the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, that is a box, the Aaron. And in, in that box is made of acacia wood. Inside the box are the tablets of the law, the original, well, actually, yeah, the original tablets of the law that uh, Moses broke. Uh, and, and on top, and the cover of that box of the Aaron is made by a, a cover that is that we're going to see the description of that that cover. And that cover contains is is has in it those figures, those angel-like figures that I spoke about uh in yesterday in my email. So I want to turn now to the text, read with you guys the um the description. Um, how many of you have access to Hebrew, like can read Hebrew, can understand somewhat Hebrew, can kind of like 
translate some Hebrew, not that I'm going to put you in the spot, just to get a sense of the room, of how is the Hebrew uh, literacy in this group. So any, lift your hands if you, if you kind of like can do some Hebrew. Anyone, some, someone, okay. Let me see, do I have a second page here that I'm not seeing? Yoela, Carmela. Okay, so we're going to be obviously doing mostly in English, uh, but sometimes, you know, Hebrew is an amazing, amazing language. And uh, it offers, when we can read it, incredible insights that I'll try to kind of um, uh, point out to the best of my ability. Yola, did you want to say anything? I see you're raising your hand. Or is it that you froze while you were raising your hand when you were saying that you speak some Hebrew? Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. So let's go to the translation. Let's go straight to the translation. So, so, so here it is. So this is God, right? Speaking, uh, telling Moses how he wants those, this cover of the iron, the cover of the box that is in the Holy of Holies uh, to be made. So um, I'll read it for now. And, and I'll just read the whole thing. And what I would like you to do as I read, if you have printed it, perfect. If you haven't, maybe make notes if you have pen and paper next to you. Pay attention to anything that feels kind of unusual, that you have a question about, that feels unclear, that feels doesn't make sense, anything that feels like slightly, that catches your attention as I read it. Okay, and uh, we'll start from there. So make to cherubim, cherubim, I don't know how to say that in English, cherubim in Hebrew, of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the cover. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. Of one piece with the cover shall you make the grooving at its two ends. The grooving shall have their wings spread out above, shielding the cover with their wings. They shall confront each other, the faces of the crewing being turned towards the cover. So I'll give you a second to kind of like bring it in, read it again on your own. Pay attention to anything that stands out in these very short, you know, three verses, three verses, three verses. And if you don't mind, if there's anything that kind of like spoke to you, let me know. Richard, please. Do I need to un unmute you? No, you can unmute yourself, right? Right. Yes. Uh the one word that really stuck out for me is confront. Mm -hmm. uh, and that word in relation in, in relation to relationships, if I can say that, uh, sounds pretty negative. And I don't know yes. if it has that connotation in Hebrew. Is there, I have no facility in Hebrew. Could yeah. you uh, yeah. guide us a little bit? Beautiful. Yes, I think it's a, I was also kind of, um, Questioning, Jill, I'll get to you uh, about that, like confront. And when the Hebrew says panim el panim, which means face to face. Now, I don't know why they translated it as confront. It could be that there is a commentator that sees that face to face as confrontational. And definitely, you know, we will talk about that confrontation as part of, you know, this journey you know, of, of deepening our relationships. So in this point, the Hebrew itself, to me personally, does not speak of confrontation, but rather facing each other. 
but it's like, it was a good question because it's yeah it's like what do you mean confronting is negative and kind of like uh conflictive yes jill thank you yeah i've always found this really difficult because we've just got told off for building the golden car which is you know represent representational object and then suddenly there's this tabernacle with representational angels and i've always found that really difficult yes and quite yes. mystifying i i Lovely. don't yeah I, I find yeah i find it confronting exactly right even and like help me with just that. talking about the golden calf yeah. and how that was a disaster in their relationship yeah. with god because we are after all you know the initiators of this journey against not journey but like war against idolatry i mean i don't want to call war again I, uh, not a good word yeah but mm. but this sense of like yeah god that is oneness and it can doesn't have a, a shape and we're right and then suddenly we go to the to the most holy space and we find figures mm. right and and that's really really confounding. we don't find an emptiness we find a play a, a space that is filled out with a box right a big mm. box and those and those figures and and yes i don't have an answer right now about it i think the answer is coming or will be coming or is like an answer that might not be a very easy answer like what is that doing there but it's a fantastic question what are those figures doing there and i think today that's in a certain way the key question why is it that in the most holy place we have an indication of right as a right confrontation or panim el panim, right facing each other of two, right, which is also multiplicity, not oneness, right, which is counter counterintuitive as well. Yeah. So good question. We'll get to that, Dalia. Yeah. But it says later that um, God says God will speak to us between the space of those two cherubim. Yes. And it, and the golden calf was not that it was an image that we thought it was God. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that the cherubim are God. Exactly. That is very true, right? We're, we're, that's a very good thing that you know, right? Like the, 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 the communication between God and the Jewish people or God and Moses or God and Aaron in the tabernacle happened in, the, in this space, in this most sacred hidden space, in the space, in this empty space between the Kruvin, right? That was the, mm -hmm. the, the locus of the communication or the center of the communication between the Jewish people, right? So those two images are not an image of God, are the vehicle, are the, the, the boundaries, are the, the space, the, 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 the images or the, I don't know, those figures that create the possibility of the of the presence of God to be revealed to the Jewish people, to the to Moses and Aaron, right? We'll get to that, right? But at least here, it doesn't say anything yet about the fact that God will speak there. Here's just telling us the structure. How is it made? Uh, Linda, please. Now I heard two different things. One regarding the direction of the faces. One was face to face. I mean. I mean, and the other said faces turned to the cover, not to each other. Beautiful. And I thought that it's interesting because it strikes me as the direction of the face, in a sense, is everything. And um, and I guess one of the things I'm looking for in the class is bringing God into relationships and um or bringing spirit or whatever you want to call it into relationships and it strikes me that where your face is directed is part of uh, you know what how it's going to evolve how the relationship will evolve anyway i'm not clear which direction the faces were right if they were towards god if they were towards the 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 cover or towards the, the cover, cover. Down, which I kind of consider towards God uh, or towards each other. Right. So they're, they're not looking up towards God, right? right? No, but I think of God yeah. as in, 
in the sense that... in between, right? But it's, as you say, Linda, it's like a, a very classic, you know, question. It's like, wait, where are they looking? Are they looking to each other? Or are they looking towards the cover? Are they looking away from each other? Are they in relationship with each other? It's the, the text itself is very ambiguous. It's not it's giving is specifically giving you a sense of like it's not clear where their focus is. They shall confront each other. They should be panim al panim. They should be facing each other. Mirda, I'll get to you. And and their faces will be turned, as we said, let me get to Mirda and then we'll 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 open that up. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. I thought that maybe they're just there to hold the space energetically, uh, like opposite energies. Yes, yes. So that's a good insight, right? Like now we go back a little bit to this idea of recognizing the space, recognizing the space that exists between these two figures and recognizing that the space is not just to and from each other, but it, it contains the whole space between them. Um, there's something that I, I who I think it was Jill that said before, right? Like, or I, I don't remember now who commented on that. That there's like a, a also an emphasis on on this number two. That there's two of them. <laughs> that there's two proving. There's not just oneness, but two entities that have to be in relationship with one another so here in the place as as Dahlia was saying the place where God is going to be talking to the Jewish people is the place where we have to attend to those two proving being in touch with each other but also not always in touch with each other not always turn towards each other but also turn towards the cover the cover is the main piece of the of the of the holy of holies, right? It's where the tablets are, are being held. It's where the Sefer Torah is being held, right? It's the place that contains. It's like that place that nobody sees. It's there and it's being carried from place to place. It's never opened. It's always closed. And these two kruvim are having an attention to each other at times, and at the same time, maybe in an ability that we don't really understand, also to the cover, also to the to the to that which, to the Torah, I guess, you know, to that which is inside the Aaron, which is inside the, the you know, to which, to that which they are covering or protecting or enclosing, right? So we're getting a lot of images of like intimacy, looking at each other, hiding, protecting, covers, separations, opposite to each other, all these elements that constitute elements of relationships, right? And in the Holy of, Holy of Holies, what we see is relationship. And it's a relationship between these two Kruvin, and it's also a relationship between us and the divine God, the spirit, what, however you guys feel comfortable calling it, is the meeting place of the, you know, of the, of, and, and it, it's an incredible thing because it's the place where the finite, the very concrete figures, right? It's not an empty space that you enter and there's nothing. Because you would imagine that that would be at the Holy of Holies, it would be a place of emptiness, space without boundaries, right? I would imagine that would be the ultimate sense of godliness. And yet that godliness is surrounded by finitude, by something that is being contained between two extremes, two figure-like extremes that contain that expansive revelation of, of godliness. It's a very interesting concept, or it's a, not even concept, experience of approaching the most holy. That says a lot, I think, about the spirituality of relationships, and it says a lot about what it takes to be in relationship. The space between us, 
the opposing of each other in the sense, and we'll talk about that more and more, like the sense of being individuals that were not just one, like there wasn't like a one figure that was like, okay, oh, right? No, it's two figures that are in relation with each other, that are like in a dynamic relationship with each other. They're looking both at each other, but also into the, into the arrow. Right, there's a dynamic, there's something that is not straight, like it's not just one thing. As it is in relationships, we attend to the other, but we attend to ourselves and we attend to the to the to those around us. And we're constantly in this game, game or or dynamic or or interplay of the elements as we come into contact with myself, with the other, with God, with our communities, with our nations, whatever it is that we come into contact with. So um, that's the, the, those are the grooving. Those are, that's the, that's the description of the most holy, holy, holy space in our, you know, in our, I don't know, structures, right? In our created structures. I want to go now to the next text um, that I brought for you. Um, the next text is by a commentator from the Middle Ages, uh, Rabbeinu um, Bechaya, whatever, like it's, we say it in different ways. Um, and, and Rabbeinu Bechaya is, um, first of all, he's from Spain, you know, so kudos to me. He's, a, you know, from Zaragoza. Uh, he's a contemporary of Ibn Gabilol of the time of the golden age of Spain. And uh, he's uh, considered a, uh, some of you might know, have, might be familiar with the word or the trend within Judaism called Musar. Anybody has heard about Musar? Just can you lift your hands, right? So, you know, Chovat Levavot is one of the main texts of Musar in our tradition. Uh, and he is the author of Chovat Levavot. Here, in this commentary, we're seeing his commentary on the book of Exodus. And he's going, it's very beautiful because I kind of like did a little bit of cheating and I kind of cut and paste a lot because there was so much material that I, we wouldn't be able to cover the whole thing today. But um, one thing that I liked very much about it, and it's because I love learning and love learning love learning Torah is that if you see it and I actually I will share screen so you those of you who weren't able to see the whole thing will will be able to see it so let's see let me do that for a second I'll share the screen how do I do that when I made the the, the page smaller and now I don't see here it is share screen Okay, if anybody doesn't see it, please tell me so because I can't see you all right now. Okay, I'm gonna make it bigger because I made it very small. Okay, if anybody cannot see it, please, please, please let me know. And I am going to Rabin Bechai. Okay, so hold on, this is the second, number two. Okay, so this is the second text that you have in your page. And I'm just gonna scroll, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a first he's going to give us the approached, you know, his commentary on the text based on the plain meaning of the text, meaning the most the, what is called pshat. Pshat in Hebrew means like, you know, the, the literal meaning of the text, the first layer of understanding, nothing too deep. This is the first, like the simple understanding of the text. In the second box. Number three, you will see Rabbi Nubachai is the, you know, a little bit further along, he says, a Kabbalistic approach to the two Kerovs, right? So he's giving you first a simple approach to understanding who are those Kruvim. And then he's going to give you a Kabbalistic one, an inner Torah, inner understanding, more spiritual understanding of the, of the, uh, of the Kruvim. Okay, so let's start with the plain meaning of the text. Would anybody like to read it? Yes, Delia, I see you right there, so it's so good. Mm 
but you have to unmute. Go. Okay. There we go. Perfect. An approach based on the plain meaning of the text. The word shanim. Shnaim kruvim. Yeah. Shnaim kruvim are necessary to teach that the two cherubs were male and female. The Torah wanted to teach that the children of Israel are as beloved of God as the love that exists between two people. This corresponds to what the sages said in Yuma 54. Rabbi Katina said that at the time when the Israelites are in the habit of appearing at the temple on the three festivals requiring them to do so, they used to roll back the dividing curtain so as to show the pilgrims the cherubs atop of the ark, which were embracing one another. And they would say to them, see how beloved you are in the, lie, in the eyes of God, just like the love that exists between two people. There is a verse in Kings which expresses the words of Rabbi Katina, where we read, you can do the Hebrew for me. Yeah. <laughs> joined, joined in an embrace of their arms like two people. Thank you. Um, so the plain meaning of the text is ascribing, you know, gender to these two cherubs, right? They're they're uh, according to the to the Gemara to the Talmud, they are proving means I think it means like uh, children. Kruvia means children, and they're like two little ch children. Um, one male, one female, according to the tradition, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, you know, I know that, you know, in these days and age, it's a little bit complicated to talk about this binary uh, distinction between the two genders, but I want to take it at face value in the traditional sense, because that's how Rabbi Bechai is talking about it, right? And that's how the tradition is talking about it. So tradition is talking about the image of the beloved, right? The image of love that exists between two people, the the image of, of closeness and embrace, physical embrace between two people that exemplifies the embrace and the closeness and the intimacy between the Jewish people and God. It's an amazing thing that the Gemara, the, the Talmud, talks about it like on the, on the three regalim, the three times a year that the Jewish people were commanded to go up to the temple to, uh, you know, to, to offer sacrifices at the temple in those three, in Pesach, Passover, in Shavuot, and in Sukkot. They would open, you know, the Kodesh Kodashim was always closed off. And one thing I didn't mention, I'm sorry that I forgot to say, is that the tabernacle, eventually when we got to Israel and established, you know, ourselves in, in the land of Israel, the tabernacle was not in use anymore. And all the items of the tabernacle became the items of the temple. So the temple, the temple in Jerusalem was a reproduction in grandeur scale and not portable, but very much right, made of stone, of the structure of the tabernacle that carried the Jewish people throughout the desert. So three times a year. You know, one thing that you probably will know as well is that the Holy of Holies, only one person was able to enter the Holy of Holies, and that was the Kohen Gadol, the, the high priest. And only the high priest could enter if it was Yom Kippur on the uh, Yom Kippur, and only if he was wearing this kind of like very simple clothing, white linen with nothing on it, nothing at all on it, he would enter, he would do the service of the Yom Kippur service inside the Holy of Holies. If he was worthy, he would survive. If he was not worthy, he would die. And then they would they would he he would carry like a like a, a rope and they would have to carry him out because he would die as a result of entering that very sacred space. And he would face the Kruvim and the presence of God would would be 
felt in between in that space. So the 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 simple meaning of the proving in this particular uh, commentary is also talking about right uh, like not only relationship but intimate relationship we're talking about embrace there's another source that says that when the when the when they would open the curtain for the people to see it was the only time that people normal people right normal like ordinary people were had access to the to the holy of holies they opened the curtains if they saw the proving embracing it would mean that there was connection between us and God. But if the Kruvin were, they, they had the capacity to face away from each other, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the movement from facing one another to facing back to back. There's a lot to, we'll, we'll get to that at some point in the course during conflict, most likely when we deal with, with friction and conflict and opposing if the proving were opposing each other were facing the other way it would be a sign of disconnection so we'll talk also about that movement from facing one another what does it mean to be see the face what is it what is it in the face that that what does the face give in terms of presence and in terms of um, information about where we're at within our relationships. And then what happens when we turn away from, from the relationship. So we'll, we'll get to that. But in this case, Rabbi Bahai is talking about, you know, the love that exists between a couple, intimacy. In the books of our tradition, the the Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, that is written by King Solomon, who is the king who built the Beit Hamikdash, and built and and you know ruled for I think how many years, forty years I think he ruled, uh, if I remember correctly the most enlightened and, and prosperous and, and peaceful time in our history. He wrote a book called Shira Shirim, The Song of Songs. And Shira Shirim, as you might know, is a book where it's all about the yearning that exists between these lovers that are constantly wanting to engage and meet each other. And very with very most of the time unable to consummate that that full embrace or that full encounter. You know, the and Shira Shirim is considered to be like the holy of holies of our of our texts. It's the deepest, the most um the book that talks about the highest level of experience of closeness with God in the form of closeness between you know, two lovers, a man and a woman, in the case of Shira Shirim. So here also, the, the Kruvim are insinuating that kind of relationship. And now I want to go to the last one. And now to the Kabbalistic approach to the two Kerubs. Anybody would like to read it? I can't see you because I'm share screening. Anybody would like to read? Just just go for it. Joel, I, I see can you read. Or, or Jill. Yeah, <laughs> it's just who I see. <laughs> Somebody go, just go. A Kabbalistic approach to the two cherubs. They were male and female, respectively, in order to teach that these two genders represent the, uh -huh. come with the Hebrew. Sure, Mashpia and Mashpia Mushpa. And Mushpa. The initiating force and the responsive force, respectively, with their faces opposite, opposite each other. 
Our sages explain that as long as the Jewish people carry out the will of their Lord, the faces of the cherubs will be turned towards the caparet, like the student who lowers his eyes before the teacher out of deference and fear. So what is he what is he saying here? What is the what is the deeper meaning that he's bringing about? About the qualities of what actually what Richard was asking about before, right? That opposing, that sense of like they're not the same, they're different. They have different qualities. They don't necessarily speak or identify with the same one is the one is the initiating force and the other one is the responsive force and they're facing each other yes yoela i see you raising your hand it's good that i have uh, you right there yeah <laughs> okay Jen, um, we'll get, Richard, we'll get to you yes please so i'm i mean uh taking from it um that uh, kind of letting go of rightness of, um, you know, convincing or therefore being defensive mm -hmm. of your truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the connection lies in the deeper understanding of yourself as well as the person you're connecting with reality and conclusions beautiful beautiful you know it makes me think uh rich i'll get to you in a second but it makes me think of this concept that i wanted actually to mention and i forgot and you just gave me the the you know the segue for that or is the flow is the sense that there is a flow between one and the other that is not static. We talked about the dynamic before, right? That is the in the understanding of each other, in the initiating and continuing and moving forward. And I give you and you give me, and I receive from you and I hear you and you hear me. And I, I, I hear you hearing me. That is the is the Kabbalistic approach of the Kirobs, right? It's not just I'm here in my side and you're here on your side and here we hold the space. But there's something that is kind of like moves, that is alive, that is ge generative in that relationship. And that is conducive for the presence of God to emerge. Uh, Richard, you want to go? And if anybody else that I'm not seeing you guys right here. Where are you? I don't see well, you. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, as a male, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with this, but every time they mention uh, two people, they talk about the male first and the female second. And they also talk about initiating force and responsive force. Yeah. Is, uh, are they trying to imply that the male is always the initiating force? Mm -hmm. And the female is always the responsive right. force. Yeah, very good question for sure. Um, yeah, I think it's not in my understanding, right? In my very, very limited understanding of Kabbalah. We're not talking about men and women. We're talking about these, these uh, structures of what it's called the masculine and the feminine. Now, every man and every woman has a feminine and a masculine in them. Right, like, or like, that. There's that range, and that, and therefore, a woman can initiate, and a man can receive, as we see in life. But here, we're talking about forces, forces of receptivity, and forces of initiation. Right? There's a there's a there's a quality of receptivity, and I think that when we think about relationships, whether you are a man or a woman, you are going to be sometimes in receptive mode and sometimes in initiating right sometimes you're going to be the one who's crossing the bridge to the other side and sometimes you're going to be receiving the other person on the other side in your in your side of the bridge right and in that and i think it in in a certain way that the learning is not so much to say oh we're being um 
kind of like restricting, you know, men and women, but actually talking about these two modes of being or these two modalities of being in relationship, of being on the receiving end or being on the giving end. Because any time that we think of, I, I don't know, you tell me, when I think of relationships, I think of give and take. I think of that flow that exists between me and you, right? That and, and in that space where the relationship lives, as Buber says, is where we exist, right? Is where we live in our relationship. And in that flow, it's like in, in any kind of flow, there's always the positive and the negative. And that's how, you know, the positive is like it's attracted to the negative and the negative to the positive and on and on and on, right? Like, and that contains the ability to flow. And, and in the oppositeness of the positive and the negative is where we also exist, right? In that sense of like, I am so similar to you, but so different from you. I can relate to you so much, but I also exist in my own independence, individuality. And how do I relate in that? How do I manage, right, those two forces? Any any other insights or questions or difficulties or disagreements? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of stop the screen share so I can see you all. Let's see. Ah, oh no, sorry, I thought I had closed the recording. I didn't. Okay. Mm. Any other insights? How does this resonate with you guys? So, Scott? Yeah, uh, good ability to read um, my potential speaking. Um, yeah, I, I'm just at the stage of appreciating the need for responsiveness, the need for initiation and response or receptivity. I tend to push down my feelings um and don't especially if they feel negative and i don't bring them out in a, in early appropriate ways and i want to do a lot better at maybe being an initiator or of of emotion and flow it's very scary for mm -hmm. for me to take that role yeah. um, but i feel like it's more and more essential in my relationships mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. It's definitely such a, um, sometimes we know what's, where's the next stage of growth for us, right, in our relationships. And sometimes it is in the level of initiating and confronting and speaking out. And sometimes it's in the giving space and not saying, and right, and, 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 and allowing and being, more passive or, or letting things be or right gentler um and a lot of in between right like it's not just those two modes but there's a lot of in between that has to do with communication that has to do with that how we communicate what we communicate when we communicate yeah and if i can uh, just add there's a I think I'm afraid of my the my intense emotions, and so they I hold them on until they come out, and I become a uh, unintentional initiator. And mm -hmm. so I want to I I'm learning how to be more intentional, early, calm, responsible initiator. Um, yeah, so it yeah, it's certainly complicating just a con a two forces, but there's a, a really responsible way to show up um, with things that seem hard. Right. I think you use the word intentionality, which is such a key key element, right? Sometimes we react 
in relationships, right? And it's so easy because relationships have a, a measure of a, of a automatic, automatic, right, mode, because we know the person, depending on the relationship, obviously, right? But like we, we engage in like the sameness. It's like, I always relate to you in this way, you know, like, you know, when I meet with this particular person, I'm always in this mode. And when I meet with this person, I'm always in this mode. And this person brings this and it's automatic. It's not intentional, right? And stepping out of it is a little bit of what, uh, you know, would, I would love to be able to do with you guys, right? It's like, learn to become a little bit more self-aware. Today, I hope we'll get to, you know, shortly to do a little bit of an exercise of recognizing the space, right? The space even within ourselves, just as a taste of recognition of space, right? And in that recognition of space, in that quietness of the recognition of my own space, the more I enter into that, the more I can be intentional, be brave, be taking chances and risks to move to the other side, right? The relationships entail those sides, those grooving, right? Those those forces, those modes that are facing each other, that are facing away, that are facing to God, that are like they contain a world, right? In that empty space in between them. Yes, Richard. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Richard first and then Linda. Okay, that's a little better. Uh, we're talking about, it says the love that exists between man and woman. Uh, is that actual or is that aspirational? Uh, <laughs> one reason I ask is says, uh, I think there's the equivalency of the, uh, the love that exists between man and God and I'm always, uh, I was in a quandary as to, is that something that already exists that I'm trying to uncover? Or is that something that I'm uh, in the process of creation with? Creating. Yeah. Beautiful. It's a, it's a very deep question. I don't know that I have an answer. I, I don't know that there is an answer. Um, I don't have an answer. So. Right. Yeah, but it's a great question. I don't know. Right. Like I, I, I would like to think that is something that is not predetermined or pre, pre-cut, but that it, it is something that has to do with my own individuality and the quality of my soul and the quality of my life and the quality of the other. And the quality of the of the relationship, I I would like to imagine that it is something that is very very uh, individualistic or like personal. Yeah, because also, you know, you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday. I was saying, you know, like the world that God created is a world of diversity complete diversity. God didn't create a world where we're all the same, all speak the same language, all like the same things, all have the same religion. Like it's completely diverse. And therefore is, is, a, is an element of a, an active element of creation that God intended. If you believe that God created the world, right? As, as I do, it's like, you know, there's an intentionality of the fact that we're all different. And by nature of that, we create and infinite quant qualities of relationships. And not only, you know, like uh, Esther Perel, which is a, uh, a uh, you know, a, a um, couples therapist that I really like. She says, how, how do, she says it really well, but I'm not gonna say it very well myself. There's something like, you know, I am married, she's been married to the same man for like 50 years, but she hopes that Oh, that she hopes that her marriage changes, changes throughout those 50 years many times, but it's always with the same man or something like that. I'm saying it terribly, but as of saying that, you know, the relationships change constantly. And that's also a very beautiful thing when we allow the relationships to change depending on 
who we are today, right? So this kind of ge generative quality is it's constantly renewing itself. And I think that also applies to our relationship with between men and women or, you know, any couple or, or with our relationship with God or that which is bigger than us, you know, like, as I can say about my own life, my relationship with God is changes. And I think it's good that it does. Because it means he's alive. Yes, you are not. I, I feel bad. Linda's first. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry, Linda. I saw Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, there was one statement that, you know, about if we do God's ways, then the, it seems I don't remember exactly what. And I always find that kind of thing troublesome. What does that mean? Does it mean am I kosher enough? Is my pace of Right. You know, it is God's rules or, or is God's rules what Scott said was really beautiful or is God's rules that we live as fully with our emotions and full, do you know what I mean? Uh, in the ways that he's attempting to grow. Yeah. Why, Why, uh, what a question. That's a hard question, uh, you know? But, but I, I, because once you get God's rules as being, because then there's always somebody who will interpret them differently and interpret them more religiously and in ways that make you, make me want to run away, <laughs> um, not bring me closer. So I'm just putting that out. I'm, I'm hoping that I, I think God's I, rules I, I, include self-growth. I would answer that very kind of briefly and maybe not even like, you know, kind of like tentatively by kind of talking about relationship also, right? Talking about a relationship with God in in a way of, of like kind of emulating a relationship that I have with somebody that is very close to me. On the one hand, in my relationship with that other person, I want to be authentic. I want to be myself. I want to express myself fully. And in the other hand, in that relationship, as we talked about before, I also have to kind of like make room for the other's ways of being. This person needs that from me. This person requires that I show up in this way and not in this way. This person needs me to say things like this and not like that, right? There's a, there's a very beautiful midrash in the Talmud that says that uh, making couples is as hard for God as, as the splitting of the Red Sea. And it's interesting to use that image of the splitting of the Red Sea as we're talking about bringing people together, right? Like why is God talking, why, why is the Talmud using an image of separation when we are talking about an image of bringing people together, right? So why am I saying that in the context of this answer is because a relationship with an other contains also accountabilities that I'm not always comfortable with or that are external to me that I wouldn't choose for myself, but that make me like, okay, I'm showing up because it's important to you. But if I only show up because it's important to you, my relationship will become resentful and dry and robot-like so that's no good. But if it's only about me and what I need and it's self-referential, then it lacks the flow. So similarly with God, I think there's a there's a similar thing of like, how do I manage this relationship with this like being, this big being, <laughs> right? However, I, I think of God, right? And, and I think in Judaism, we have in the structures of Judaism, we have the laws that are the structures. And then we have the, the heart and the intimacy and the shira shirim, the, the, the song of songs that talks about the yearning and the, the love affair and the beloved, right? And they need, they both need to be there because without that, it's a lacking relationship. 
Does that answer somehow, Linda? Does Joella? I really like your name, Joella. Thank you. Yeah. My parents made it up, but uh, that my my siblings are Alon and Maya, and they're new immigrants. So after they had two, is oh. really like we'll be creative with the last one. Um, <laughs> So I'm not saying anything like new. It's like what we're all saying. But um, when you were saying about a story that happened yesterday, it reminded me yesterday, I got a call from a friend who was um, really having a hard time communicating with her partner. And uh, she understood what he needed, but he wasn't hearing her. And, um, and she was in a lot of like pain and just feeling really overwhelmed. So I sent her... Um, the, uh, me and my wife do couples counseling and we have this format aftermath of a fight and it, it breaks it down. You know, you're both going to say how you feel and it's about how you feel, not about how the other person, and it's just like, <laughs> you know, how to have a conversation and really say what you need to say, but also make space to hear the other person. And at first they were like, I don't know if we can do it, but they call me back in the evening and they had printed it out and circled their answers and talked. And she said, it's amazing when you can be heard, the anger just dissipates. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it made me think today, I was, I was telling my wife, I was like, can, can anyone be in, can anyone be married or in a relationship with anyone as long as they figure out how to continue to communicate with each uh -huh. other? Like, uh -huh. you know. That's kind of the key of everything is just having a language with like, it could be anyone in a sense, as long as you're both willing to put in the work to figure out how to communicate constantly. Constantly. Yeah. But communicating is difficult, right? It's like, a, it's, it's like a whole art as we, you know, that we keep on learning more subtle and more subtle and more subtle because I think that after all what we're, what I, I feel like I land in is like we're so mysterious you know each one of us is so mysterious and it's so mysterious when I speak and I say something what I really mean and do I know what I mean and do I know what I'm asking for do I really know how to express it and is the other person really understanding it right like it's like we enter into like oh a universe of uh delightful and complicated and annoying reality of what it means to be human <laughs> you know? okay so maybe not everyone could be married to just that anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah next week i want to talk about the concept of the uh, the black fire and white fire uh and uh it says that in the Midrash Rabbah, in the Midrash, it says that before God gave the, the Torah to Moses, he, for, he gave him uh, the Torah in this, like, uh, it, that it was a white fire and a black fire. And in the way that it showed in the scroll is like, if you see that in the page, you have the white and the, and the black, right? So the black is the letter and the white is the space around the letter. So we'll, we'll learn about that, another form of space, another form that has to do with communication and what happens as we try to breach, right? Like or reach out and, and express with language to the other, right? Um, we'll get to that. But talking about the complexity of language. Should we do a little kind of like a very short meditation together? Can we, do you guys want to, or you want to talk more? You can unmute. Um, I'm happy doing a meditation. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me okay. too. I'd like to do what you plan, you know, what you plan. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So let's meditation. do it. We'll do like a, you know, like a short version. Uh, so we have, a, you know, like a three or four minutes at the end to kind of like last thoughts. So let me get my notes. 
so I can guide it um, appropriately. Okay, so find yourself in a comfortable position. Um, um, close your eyes and let your attention kind of go inward. You might want to feel your breath right now going in and out. And when you're ready, we're gonna take a couple of kind of conscious deep breaths. Inhaling deeply now. And then taking it out breath slowly. As you let the breath out, please feel the sensations of releasing the breath and the release that it offers and the relaxation that the out breath can offer as you release the air slowly. As you breathe in and breathe out again, hold your breath before you breathe out and release slowly, relaxing your jaws, relaxing your shoulders and dropping down more and more deeply into your sitting position. I'm taking one more deep breath pausing and then breathing out, allowing for the letting go to happen as you drop down into the exhalation. Now just breathe normally, allowing the sounds around you to come in, feeling your own internal sensory activity, feeling your heart. And I wanna offer a very short guided meditation to help us Deepen our awareness. Of the space inside of us and outside of us. First, just kind of loosening any tension that you might feel at the moment. Letting it go. Softening the belly so that the breath can be received in softness. And this form of meditation will be me asking and repeating a question. The question will be, can you imagine? Can you imagine the space between your eyes. Can you imagine the space in your nasal cavity? Can 
you imagine this space in your throat? Can you imagine the space between your shoulders? Can you imagine the space inside your belly? Can you imagine the space inside your arms, your hands, and your fingers? Can you imagine the space between your arms and your hands? Can you imagine the space between your legs and your feet? Can you imagine the space that fills your whole body? Can you imagine this space that extends before you? Can you imagine this space that exists behind you? Can you imagine this space that exists beside you? Can you imagine the space that exists under you, beneath you? Can you imagine the space that exists above you? When you're ready, take a deep breath. And at your own time, you can come back for a space. If there's anything that you feel like you would like to share in terms of what you take with you from today, would love to hear it. In the last couple of minutes that we have left. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for the free session. And um, I, I felt my back crack when I sat up. I think with everything uh, going on for the last many months, um, I am like this and I'm crying and I'm down and, you know, um, and it felt I was really in that meditation. So I, I, I just 
holy. I'm so humbled by anyone who can help me slow down and calm myself down. So thank you. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the meditation as well. I, I find it different from the normal types of meditation I find that I've been practicing. I find it really helpful, actually, very calming. And I enjoyed uh, reading the text and the discussions and uh, seeing of the Kabbalah, of Kabbalistic approach of the cherubs, mm -hmm. uh, the regenerative side of it. I found that quite um, interesting. So thank you. My pleasure. I, and I wanted to ask you, what was the name of a psychologist you mentioned? You mentioned uh, a Esther, psychologist, I yeah. think. Esther Perel. Ah, uh, Esther Perel. Thank you. Yes. Perel. P E R R E L. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah. I also enjoyed the test very much. I was kind of worried that it would become a therapy here and. Uh, and a little scared of entering because uh -huh. I'm not comfortable in that kind of setting with groups. Yeah. But the, the text brought it all meaningful. Thank you. My pleasure. Glad to hear. <laughs> My relationships can be scary. <laughs> but I didn't want it to be like each one is going to tell, oh, I might say this right. and that. Right, totally. And the danger of a group that it could become that. Then. Yes, yes. Totally. But I also appreciated the group's openness. Yeah. Yeah. It, it helped me. Uh, once I really appreciated that. Yes. As well as you, Sabrina. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Beautiful. So sending you off with blessings. We should all be safe this week and well. And uh, we should hear, as we say in Hebrew, good news. Good news. Yeah. Yeah. Take good care. Nice seeing you all. Thank you for sharing this space with me today. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>